Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. We're here in the Duesenberg room. We call it that because this room is filled with Duesenbergs. These are all pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we're going to talk about not a Duesenberg today, but a car that was originally going to be called the Baby Duesenberg. Gordon Bjorg, the legendary designer, was asked by E.L. Cord to design a Baby Duesenberg. And then with the economy, everything happens and things that went on, there are a number of reasons. They decided just to call it the Cord. And it turned out to be one of the most revolutionary uh, cars and certainly one of the most beautiful cars of all time. Here it is right here, the 1937 Cord 812. Interesting history, Gordon Bjorg, when he worked for uh, General Motors, they had a design contest among uh, all the designers. He entered something very similar to this, came in last. They said, nobody will go for that, too impractical. Of course, when he left uh, General Motors and went back to work for E.L. Cord, he took that design with him and, and made this legendary automobile. This car has a number of firsts. First car ever to have enclosed headlights. First car ever to have the gas cap hidden under a door at the rear. First car ever to have a horn ring rather than a button. The car sat extremely low. You know, Hudson always gets credit for being the step-down design, but really, Cord had it almost 12 years earlier. Uh, beautiful looking car, and a car built on a budget. You know, by the time this car came along, Cord was not quite out of business. And they said, look, you're just gonna have to make do with what we got. We don't have a lot of money. Rather than design a new wheel, they had a problem with the brakes overheating, so they just decided to cut holes here to cool the brakes. It worked tremendously well and made actually a better looking wheel than if they had designed a whole new wheel. And got the optional cord uh, driving lights. Those are pretty rare. You notice these doors are exactly the same. It's just a mirror image of one another. They didn't have tooling to do a separate rear door. They said, look, just make do with what you got. And uh, the great thing about Americans are when they're put in a corner, they don't have a lot of money to work with, they get extremely creative. And that's what Gordon Burek did here. Uh, Cord developed their own engine for this car, 288 cubic inch motor, developed about 125 horsepower, 170 to 190 horsepower supercharged. This is not the supercharged car. Supercharged cars are nice, but I, I like this one and I couldn't find a supercharged car. And I'll tell you the reason I bought this one. Uh, you know, there was a whole generation of guys in the 20s and 30s, much like kids today that are just natural computer whizzes. This car was restored by a gentleman named Arthur Pere. Uh, he was an older guy, Italian, just like me and my dad. Uh, not uh, a formally educated guy, but one of those guys who just had a natural instinct with tools. You know, when this car came out, it wasn't quite finished. It got a bad reputation because the transmissions didn't shift properly, uh, they overheated, uh, people couldn't get the electric switches to work, and they got a bad, bad reputation. But the cars were so incredibly beautiful that people just wanted to save them. And Mr. Pere, who in his teens didn't know where his life was going, and when he was 17 years old, they brought him a shop class, they gave him a lathe, and he turned out to be one of those genius guys that could make anything on a machine. And he bought this car in 1984, and he spent 20 years restoring it, and he did an immaculate job. You know, usually, at least when I buy a car that's, oh, 100% restored, I gotta go through and do the whole thing again because people cut corners. Well, that was the exact opposite here. As good as it looks on the outside, all the really good stuff is on the inside. This car shifts and drives uh, like a brand new car. In fact, even Gordon Beering himself was impressed by the job uh, Mr. Pere did. Here's his picture right here. That's Arthur, that's Gordon Bjorg in the center, and that's his wife right there, and here's the car. Although I never got a chance to meet Miss Perret, I met his two sons. They called me, and they said that uh, they were trying to sell this car, and their dad would have wanted to go to somebody like me, and I was ex extremely touched by that. I thought that was really a nice thing, and they told me what they wanted for the car, and I said, great, I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, when I got it here, it was everything I thought it would be, because usually there's just problems. You know, there's always something wrong. But not this time. This guy was a real gentleman and a real genius and really knew what he was doing. Uh, it's a 1937 Cord, a 812 Westchester four-door sedan. And he even did a, a nice job on the upholstery. Uh, what he did was he got original fabric. Now, originally it would have been leather, but he did the leather pattern in the Cord fabric. Let's take a look. Great looking interior on this car. A fairly small car by 1930 standards. 
Uh, that was one of the problems selling the car as well. People like big, imposing cars, you know, cars with girth, you know. And uh, this was a kind of a small, sporty, sexy kind of car. And because the doors are the same front and back, there's a very funny issue of Time Magazine from 1938. It shows a woman trying to get in the back seat of one of these cords. And it can be a little bit tricky, but it's not that tricky. It's not that bad. Got my cord handbook. You have to have this if you own one of these cars. And I think it's the most beautiful four-door sedan ever made. The legendary coffin nose. And here's another one of Arthur's touches, you know. You don't want to drill in here or put a rear view mirror on or clamp it on the door. So he made this here. It fits right on the handle. And you, you know, for a car show, you can take it off. But when you're actually driving the car and using the car, it works tremendously well. Let me show you how the headlights open. See these cranks here? You have them on both sides. You turn these and your headlights rise up out of the front. You know, I actually prefer this to some kind of vacuum switch or electric switch that's always breaking. This is very simple to do. It's fairly bulletproof, and you always know your lights are gonna work. As you can see, he did a beautiful job under the hood as well. Uh, Mr. Perret was, uh, he was a perfectionist, you know? Just one of those old school machinists, one of those old school Italian guys like you'd find at Maserati or Ferrari, except he was just kind of an American version of that. Nothing leaks, nothing weeps oil. Uh, he put so many hours into this car. Uh, it's almost like you're paying 10 cents an hour for his work, you know? Obviously, a guy like this would make 75 to $100 an hour, but then nobody could afford the car. Uh, but he did just a beautiful, beautiful job. I think this car looks and runs better than it would have had it just left the factory. Everything is stock under the car, stock air cleaner. Oh, here's your electro transmission here. This is the thing that causes everybody headaches. If you don't know what you're doing, oh boy, that's gonna be a problem. You have all these electronic switches here, and you always wanna leave these in neutral because you don't wanna leave it in gear and then let it sit for a day because <laughs> then it might be a little tricky to start. You wanna leave it in neutral, pull the emergency brake. Although this is not a supercharged car, it does have the outside exhaust, which I, I think makes it look especially sexy. Arthur also made these beautiful screens himself. You have something here that's kind of interesting called a Start X. And what that is, is you turn the key, and then when you press the clutch, you automatically engage the starter. There's no starter button. That was another kind of innovation on the cord. This thing had all sorts of interesting innovations on it, especially the, uh, the vacuum shifting transmission. Hudson and Terraplane had that as well, but it was most famous on the cord. That's the same transmission Tucker used when he came out with his uh, famous Tucker in 1948. He just went back and bought up a bunch of Auburn, uh, <laughs> wrecked Auburns and pulled the transmissions. Uh, the engine is essentially mounted backwards, driving the front wheels. Everybody credits Citroën, you know, with the front wheel drive. But uh, I think this is a much better car. It's a V8. It's got twice as much horsepower as a Citroën. Uh, Ab Jenkins sent a lot of speed records with one of these on the Bonneville Soft Flats. I think one, I think one speed record lasted, what, 17 years, something like that. So they were, they were quite sporty to drive. They were fast, they were luxurious. Trouble is they were a little bit expensive. You know, you could buy two brand new Oldsmobiles for what this car cost back in, uh, back in the 30s. And easily one of the most beautiful dashboards in automotive history. You have your speedometer, tripometer, odometer, tachometer, oil pressure, clock. This is your radio and your radio speaker up here. This is your radio volume, uh, key, ammeter, fuel level. You got two glove boxes right here. Uh, this is your little gear shift lever here. This is a lot of fun to use. You, you pre-select. What you do is you put it up in second. Let's say you're in first, you pull away. As soon as you touch the clutch, it shifts into second. Then you pre-select your next gear. As soon as you touch the clutch, it shifts again, and so on. As I said, first car to have a horn ring. That became standard on American cars about 50 years after that. You had your uh, cigarette lighter. I love the little defrosters up here. Look at that, nice little touch here. Uh, you have air vents here, as well as a windshield that opens. You screw these on here. And ventilation, not a problem in these cars. You know, this is before air conditioning, so they wanted to get as much air in the car as they could. Headlights, 
hand throttle, choke, and instrument lights as well. Got your cigarette lighter down here and your optional heater under here as well with the two doors you're gonna open up. It drives like a much more modern car. And you can turn on your interior lights here as well. Not the biggest trunk in the world. That was another problem with these. Uh, here it is right here. As you can see, not a huge trunk. You got your spare tire. That was another problem with the car. Uh, later models, they made a Beverly model. It had a big hump back here for a trunk. More practical, but really took away from the beauty and the lines of the car. Notice your tail lights are recessed. Even got the original 1937 license plate on there as well. You know, it's probably time to take it for a ride. Now, I know Arthur is up there watching, so we're gonna be very careful. We turn on the key, you release emergency brake, put the clutch in, you pre-select the gear, first gear, let the clutch out, and you're ready to go. It's almost hard to convey what a nice driving car this is. It really drives like a car almost from the 50s or 60s. It's hard to believe it's in the 30s. This was originally intended to be the Baby Duesenberg, and I think that would have been a fitting name for it because uh, like a Duesenberg, it is a top quality, innovative automobile. Pre-selected boxes are very popular in Europe. They had the Wilson, they had the Cotel. Americans never really took to it. Uh, Cord was really one of the few that did it. As I said, Hudson and Terraplane tried it out, but for some reason, Americans didn't like it. We liked our cars big, dumb, and simple. And this thing was pretty uh, sophisticated for the time. The fourth gear is really just an overdrive. And obviously, you can't really speed shift with this thing, but it's not that kind of vehicle. Brakes are excellent. This would be what you'd call back in the 60s a mid-sized car. You know, it costs as much as a Cadillac, but of course, it wasn't as big as a Cadillac. And you couldn't carry a lot of luggage in it. Gotta admit, it's a great looking car. I love looking through that rear view mirror and seeing that cathedral window. I just love the Art Deco styling and the white piping. And you gotta admit, that's the prettiest dashboard in the world. And that, I mean, that would look good in a car today. All the information, all the gauges. And look, you can check your oil right here while you're running. See, now it's gas, press that, it turns to oil level. You know, when I drive this thing around, kids think I've chopped it and dropped it and done a lot of custom work to it. They find it hard to believe this is exactly the way the car looked in 1937, but imagine looking at Fords and Chevys and then going to the auto show and seeing this thing. In fact, when this car debuted at the auto show, they got 7,000 requests. People were standing on the bumpers of the other cars at the show just to get a look at this thing. But again, Auburn didn't have the money. Auburn Car Duesenberg didn't have the money to do it right. You know, the car was quickly rushed into production. I think Gordon Buick did the whole car in like six months or four months, something like that. When it was at the New York Auto Show, it didn't have any internals. Uh, the transmission was not running yet, was not hooked up. Uh, they didn't have a running prototype. And by the time the car was actually ready to be delivered to the public, you know, people kind of lost interest or moved on. But those that bought them loved them, you know. But you had to be an enthusiast. You had to understand what you were dealing with. The original uh, car that Bury had designed was even more radical than this. He wanted the engine compartment sealed off with separate radiators so the engine wouldn't get dirty. Uh, but that, uh, that didn't work, so they went to a more conventional placement. Beautifully balanced engine, made by Lycoming in Pennsylvania. Lycoming was another company owned by E.L. Cord. So he had them build all the motors as he did the Duesenberg motor. And boy, it, it, it's responsive and it breathes. It's hard to believe it's a flathead engine. Goes around corners well, not a lot of body lean, low to the ground. And with modern radial tires, handling is impeccable. We're on a windy road, notice there's no body lean, there's no roll. I'm more than keeping up with modern traffic. No shake, no shutter, none of the traditional front wheel drive problems. This is a car truly built for the modern highway system, which was just starting to come into play in America. I really like the closed cars more than the open cars. To me, it's, it's more snug and it's more rigid. There are a few things you can do to upgrade these a little bit. To this day, guys in the Cord Club, they drive their cars from New England to Indiana every year for the ACD uh, Festival. That always happens in September. 
The next car this innovative, at least on the uh, American side, would be the Chevrolet Corvair with the rear engine air-cooled flat six motor. But that's another chapter, and we'll talk about uh, that at a later time. Oh, and one more thing, I'm not going to do a burnout. Arthur would kill me for that. You know, I always resisted these for years. I always thought they were beautiful cars, but I thought, well, ah, I want to get a cord, front wheel drive. How fast could it be? Must have torque steer, must pull. Boy, I couldn't have been more wrong. I'm so glad I got this car, and I'm glad I got it from uh, Arthur. So Arthur Pere, you did a terrific job restoring this car. I will keep it, and when I go, it'll go to someone else, but you'll always be the man who restored it. So, thank you, pal. I'm going to go take a ride in your honor right now. See you next week.